Fantastic. What a great um, morning we've had so far talking about lighting. lighting. It's so nice, I think, at conferences when there is a real uh, specialism that is touched upon. You know, it's great to talk about the bigger picture, but when you actually talk about water features or lighting or those kind of things, it's really great to get into the detail. And I think from Peter and Guido this morning, we saw some really fantastic projects, stylistically quite different. Um, one kind of working on quite a naturalistic kind of lower footprint kind of theme, whereas Peter was working more in a public space and quite in your face and big. So, um, you know, and I think with lighting, it's very easy to see it and to think, oh, that's using lots of energy, so that is kind of a bad thing. But the reality is it's no different to any other thing in landscape. We've got to think about all elements as to whether they're sustainable or not. So with that in mind, I think it would be really nice to speak to a, a Moscovite first, um, because when I come into Moscow, there's lots and lots of lights in the streets at the moment at this time of year. So I'd like to ask um, Gleb about you know, what, what is the attitude towards light at this time of year with all of the decoration in the city? And is there any kind of like legislation from the Moscow local government at all, which um, kind of is, is, is changing the way light is used? С точки зрения законодательства, не готов ответить на вопрос. С точки зрения подхода общего к ландшафту, мы видим явную избыточность относительно того, что показывала Лариса Викторовна про Петербург, деликатность, тонкость подхода. В Москве очень много хозяйствующих субъектов, которые не договорились о правильном использовании света. И если в каких-то разделах мы видим очень красивое использование, света в разных аспектах, как праздничном, так и функциональном, то э, при этом видим множество диких несообразностей, о которых хотелось бы сказать. So do you think that a, a new look and, and, and legislation perhaps is required in, in Moscow with, with regards to light pollution and how light is used? Uh, I deal with uh, the private landscape uh, design and I drew my conclusions from the things uh, I have seen. And um, this is just again, I haven't considered uh, the legislation framework in Moscow. So this is something to be sorted out. But the things we see, well, show the trend. And we see that this is uh, developing and becoming better. That's clear. At the same time, the availability of landscape uh, lighting and the bad use of some solutions means that uh, some legal requirements uh, should be in place. And if we limit, say, the use of uh, landscape um, lighting and um, the use of uh, landscape um, lights for advertising, then Moscow will become better. And the things which are used now for advertising, they are destructive for the overall image of Moscow. That's one thing. And another thing is that they are out of place in terms of the lighting scenarios. The things uh, mentioned, uh, so we have doors separately, we have utilities, doing their things separately and we have some other companies doing their own things and all of that is out of order and a bad match together. Spasiba, Spasiba. Olga, let's go to St. Petersburg. So in St. Petersburg, you're chief curator of the gardens of the Imperial Museums um, and you have no lighting there. So have you seen that there has been a positive uh, effect of, 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 that, of that reality? Good afternoon, colleagues. Exactly. The gardens in the very heart of St. Petersburg, the summer garden, has no lights. It has no lights at all. This happens, happened after the renovation. And it was the way before. It was uh, the first garden in St. Petersburg. It didn't have any lights. 
and our scientists said it's uh, in the summer it should sleep in the winter so no lights here and they said that they were against it you know they said only our only over our uh, dead bodies though initially we had some uh, projects uh, of pop-up uh, lights uh, but this didn't work and uh, people defended this wholeheartedly and now time passed after renovation it's uh, seven years or even eight now and uh, we have a sector for monitoring and research it monitors everything the plants we have uh, every plant and a shrub and a flower bed uh, we are adding to this we monitor uh, the birds and the insects so we do different uh, analysis and now we see a unique situation so yesterday some talked about the pit stops uh, for the birds and insects so we can have things like that in Petersburg. you know these uh, green walls which were not well perceived initially they are a kind of protection for birds and insects and uh, there our monitoring center was really happy that uh, uh, last year a nightingale uh, came uh, to the um, uh, raspberry uh, garden so this is very good when you look at this uh, from the satellite it's a dark hole but it became you know uh, um, safe heaven for many birds and insects and even grasses now we are running some experiments we don't touch some baskets we just leave them, leave them there so we say that we don't cut it until the birds uh, don't start flying the young birds and uh, in two baskets we just leave leaves as an experiment so that different uh, insects can find their shelter there so this is a forced experiment which has shown that this is uh, good well things like that should stay in the cities this way we save uh, the birds and the insects uh, which uh, live nearby we need this and uh, they protect uh, the image of the city in a way that's perfect you've seen a real uplift in, in terms of uh, the, the advantages to wildlife but um, you obviously have your really lovely long summer nights um, in June and, uh, and those months when people can use the parks but if you don't have lighting in the winter does it not mean that the does it not mean then that they're not able to be used by people throughout the whole of the year particularly in those more depressing months we're lucky we have the Mikhailov uh, we have some uh, other imper imperial gardens uh, and the Mikhailov um, garden works the transit garden garden it has some light but it, it is a uh, warm a uh, yellow uh, lighting and uh, you know the summer garden is also available but uh, at winter it's extremely uh, dark so you shouldn't go there after 5 p.m. Well, it's open, it, it is safe, we have some guardians there, uh, it's um, wiped uh, so you can uh, pass through and uh, we keep track of these people. About one million uh, comes uh, throughout the year, but most of the people come in the summer, not so many in the winter. Uh, Georgi, you are a, a biologist and ornithologist. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we're really interested in is, is how lighting kind of affects birds and insects. Maybe you can share your views on kind of lighting and, and the impact it, it, it can have on, on bird life and what we can do to reduce any negative um, effects. Okay, let me take this. The bird's physiology. Well, I'm not going to discuss the physiology from the perspective of light. I'd like to discuss some other things. We have a specific thing. In the, in the year 2016, a woman called me and she said, I'm from the design bureau Strelka. This is a consulting bureau. This is a huge thing they deal with the biggest uh, city projects they keep track of some other projects they do some other things so to cut it short they said we need to eliminate the Vorobyov hills do you know the Vorobyov hills and she said well we need your expert judgment and who am I I said 
well, where did you get my contacts? And she didn't say, well, you know, but I'm nobody here because my words are um, useless. But for some reason, they know that I uh, know a thing or two about it. So they sent this project to me. I decided to go for it because it was interesting. They sent it to me, at the pictures and, and words. And these pictures, there are many things we can see there. Well, just imagine. You, you, you know, all my uh, hair, I don't have a lot of it uh, stood on air. And I read it in detail. There were many things about the good and bad uh, lights and how the birds should be protected and other things. And uh, the pictures showed uh, this cacophony. And uh, they did it. And I said things like that. Well, if this project should be implemented like that, then the Vorobyov hills are dead, as good as dead. And, well, you know, I try going against, uh, well, I don't like religious terminology, but, you know, this is sacred. You know, this is a, a small strip. So it's about 150, 200 uh, meters uh, wide. And uh, this is, uh, I believe, this used to be the real natural forest in Moscow. It was really hard to destroy because it's not uh, available to equipment and to uh, uh, things were planted there naturally and it lived properly based on geobotanic uh, additions and there are so many nightingale issues. We're specifically wanting to talk about lighting here. So with your experience and, and your knowledge of bird life, can you for me explain, because I, I don't have a lot of experience, what, how, does, how does lighting in the landscape affect birds in terms of their migration and in terms of how they live and all those kind of aspects okay i don't think it impacts their migration and as for the residents those who have nests there every uh, night call night uh, lights uh, are a big problem so we lost birds in the warabi of hills so every night uh, lights so talking about the good and bad light is useless any light at night doesn't let birds live there and not only the birds by the way that's that's it. Perfect. Spicy though. Jim. So um, from your work yesterday, we saw that you've got a real interest in the, the natural Australian landscape and also the cultural significance. So you touched on quite a few things about insects in particular in, in your gardens and everything. Um, in, in, from, again, from a point of view of, of lighting, is there, is there a negative impact or anything that we can do to, to reduce the, the, the effects? Um, yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting topic. Uh, uh, one of the projects I talked about yesterday, for those that were here, um, I planted a new lawn and, um, and I bought some just cheap solar lights uh, in the, and I just placed them in the garden. And so every evening they'd just turn on automatically and they'd turn off in the morning as the sun rose. But I was getting problems with my lawn. I was getting grubs, uh, a curl grub, and it's the grub that becomes the African black beetle. Um, and, and the problem with the grub is that it lives under the, the lawn and it chews the roots of the lawn. And the impact of the lawn is that it goes quite uh, yellow and straw-like and it's almost like it needs more water. Now, the only way to get rid of this grub is to use quite a strong chemical, which is not good, and the chemical kills bees, for instance. Um, now, the summer, that we're still at the end of summer in Australia, and my lights, because they're now quite old, they don't work, and it's the first year I haven't had grubs. So I'm now wondering whether there's a correlation, and I'd be interested to hear uh, from other people on the panel, a correlation between... Uh, the, the impact of garden lighting and insect infestation and hence then the use of chemicals in gardens. So um, maybe that m now my lights aren't working, I've resolved the problem of this curl grub without using chemicals. But has there been any research done on that, Peter? Or? Yeah, there's phenomenal research because what they find is that in areas which are <coughs> lit, exactly with this type of LED lighting, you get a phenomenal increase in insects being attracted to it. And that's based on the fact that 
The LED lighting has got, of a certain temperature, which is very important, has got a very high UV content, and the insects use UV for identification. So, for example, the nectar-giving plants manifest themselves to nighttime insects precisely by the UV signature, which our eye can't see. Mm. So there is an enormous amount of research on that. Equally, there's an enormous amount of research going on on the way birds use their vision, which is not human vision, for migration and orientation. So for example, New York now passed the legislation that any new high-rise building will need to have patterns on glass. They cannot be pure glass anymore because they reckon that New York uses a couple million birds a year through impact into glass, into transparent buildings. And they also now realizing that lighting skyscrapers creates total disorientation in birds, which makes them to fly in the dark part of the building and therefore kill themselves. So there's now a lot of research going on because people find these dead birds all over New York. And suddenly people are realizing that there's a big problem. And, and also I'm quite interested, is, is there, is there a, a correlation between the different colors of light yeah. and the impact on things like insects? So can, can you deter them and encourage or...? If you, uh, it's, if you go into any butcher shop, you will see blue light doing <laughs> killing the flies because insects get naturally attracted to blue light and I was amazed that it took people so long to make the connection while they were using it to mm. kill flies for so long. Mm. And I think the, the working with Philips now, and they're one of the biggest companies uh, making LED program lights, they realize that the key to it is, it's very complicated because the the uh, wavelength of the light is important. The color temperature of the light is important, but also the amount of energy that's emitted from the light source is important. So you got all these three things. So what Larissa mentioned is a very interesting point. I was um, involved with a lighting scheme, and I said to the client, look, you don't need to overlight the building. It's like in the Second World War, when a soldier was smoking a cigarette, you could see the cigarette over three kilometers, and he endangered the whole platoon of soldiers. But actually, if you took the cigarette and tried to read a newspaper, you can't. So the same thing with the television tower. If the energy and intensity of the light is the equivalent of a cigarette, you see it, but the impact is very limited to a certain range around the tower. So is that people need to get a more sophisticated, knowledgeable understanding of these issues. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Larissa, so uh, Peter just mentioned there, there was, there was lots of great lighting in your talk and lots of diversity, and I think you you know, it's, it's very obvious to me, I've been to St. Petersburg once, it's a very historical um, city with absolutely fantastic architecture. Um, because of the conservative um, feel towards the, the city from, the, from the, the people who live there, um, you mentioned there was some kind of, you know, people weren't happy at times and everything. Um, how do you ov overcome that? Um, and are you making efforts to make sure that there are also schemes that are perhaps that, 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 that do that do have big areas where there where there isn't lighting and is specifically um, uh, allowing there to be zones for wildlife that aren't affected by by any form of lighting in St Petersburg? No, like I 
we started dealing with this uh, last century. And uh, we have had many issues on how to properly arrange uh, the lighting scheme for the city to support the new functions and uh, on one hand and to maintain the things you have talked about. And uh, we have uh, legislation on this. I believe in Moscow is just developing. In um, St. Petersburg we already have this. Uh, we have uh, determined uh, the areas we call the reserve areas. We have no lights there at all. Uh, this is for the um, ducks migration areas. And uh, we also have uh, some other requirements. We have uh, the Piskarovs Park and some gardens, which have a special status, special protection status. And they are city areas, but still we pick a special mode for them. So we have places where people can uh, work or do skiing. And there are some other areas where people cannot come. Uh, this is really important. This is uh, now supported by legislation. We have very good uh, ecologists who help us, the architects, do it properly. And uh, now our people are also educated better. The Piskarov, Piskarov Park, that's why we try to have a new type of lighting. We have the uh, uh, Piskarov uh, graveyard close by with a memorial uh, s setting. And so it's important in terms of uh, of moral morals and nothing is preserved in the landscape and uh, gently with um, people living there we decided to make uh, this area well the way it was to have a kind of park there and so that the lighting uh, is removed from there so understanding this having the legislation understanding uh, the things that people think uh, and we are quite active and engaging with the people and we also need to invite experts and we have experts here and I'm ready to uh, engage with them this is really crucial because we you know shouldn't go into this um, specified fields um, uh, specialized fields so we need experts from these fields to help us and this uh, joint decision making when we take uh, this uh, list of uh, initiatives. Um, so I believe this is something we should do as a community, and I believe this is one of the reasons bringing us here. If you've been having that kind of work that you're doing in St. Petersburg at the moment, so Flower Jam is a great um, kind of offer there to almost make some connections where you can share some information perhaps with your client, you know, with regards to, to lighting and things in the city. Uh, and, and so that's the, that's the wildlife. In terms of people, you mentioned gloomy skies in St. Petersburg, which we have in the UK a lot. Um, and we rely on lighting a lot for people from an emotional point of view to, to lift their spirits. Um, do you use lighting in that way to have an emotional impact on people? And have you had any research or feedback that supports that it has a, a positive benefit? We deal with sociologists who do this uh, opinion polls. We have uh, the Atmore University, and uh, they train experts for this, and they are leaders in Russia. They uh, win uh, grants in this very field. And one thing to mention is the, the emotional component of it. And you know, I'm uh, really impressed with Peter because Peter is saying the right things. And uh, this is exactly the things uh, to be known by every architect uh, who starts uh, working. So it's not to, to start uh, with the uh, design requirements, uh, the things, uh, but we should start with the technical engineering, psychological and social things. And only after that, design comes. Otherwise, if we don't figure out these things, uh, whatever the design is, if uh, people and those who are close by, the birds and insects, if they don't like this area, then uh, there is no any sense in what we are doing. And so this should be the prevalent thing. And that's what we are guided by in our city. The psychological comfort of uh, anyone who is in a given area. Well, I cannot say that uh, everything is uh, in this plain colors. We have more active, uh, more dynamic colors, but overall, the overall concept 
uh, is preserved even for, for the new neighborhoods. Well, I don't know whether we are on the right track or not, but uh, the fact that we have uh, quite a lot of good positive things. We have the internet now, and we have the web portal, say, in Pittsburgh, and there people discuss things, and uh, we consider this. And now we are considering another position uh, where we have more selfies taken uh, in the city. And I can tell you, yeah, I can tell you that quite unexpectedly we saw this. In the past we said, okay, there's concepts, uh, panoramas, and the color things and so on. Well, people take images where they are psychologically um, comfortable and they upload it to the internet. And this is an important indicator. We started analyzing these places which are most attractive and uh, this exactly the areas. So we invited experts to analyze uh, this, why? And uh, this is ba a foundation of the new concept of the new continuous uh, pedestrian routes. So we can buy the transit, the pedestrian routes, the historic context, and the new functions. And uh, this is a huge undertaking. And uh, we are doing it. And uh, these uh, unexpected things like internet selfies, they prompted us uh, to reinvent uh, some of these areas. I'm going to bring Taisia in now, now Peter. So, Taisia, you um, probably have the longest history or the, the most knowledge, let's put it that way, of landscape architecture in, in Russia. Um, and I'm interested in the change that's taken place when it comes to, to lighting and, and your views on, on kind of how things were with, with, with um, the approach to lighting landscape, how they are now, and whether you think that there needs to be change, whether it's good or bad. Thank you. That's a very good way to tackle this issue, and the question is really um, well posted. Though, let me bring you back to the first uh, question you asked of Gleb. So, do we have any uh, laws in Moscow on lighting and so on? We have the Moscow government decree on improving the conditions of the evening and uh, celebrations uh, elimination in the city, but we don't have it split uh, into more detailed parts. And today, the way I see it, well, for most of my professional life, I have uh, dealt with the city environment, with building a comfortable environment in the city, and uh, with this in mind, I have a lot of negative emotions, and I can name specific things here. Well, initially, the city lights were dealt with by experts. Those who started with uh, bringing their work uh, to the landscape councils, where landscape arch architects participated, and they primarily eliminated buildings, and they replaced uh, lighting uh, fixtures uh, in the main uh, streets and highways, and this worked. And uh, there are some good examples of this. But uh, if you look at uh, the landscape uh, lights for some historical sites, like uh, the boulevard uh, ring, so this is, uh, you know, uh, so intensive and aggressive lights. We call them chemical lights. And I cannot see the trees behind us. Well, in the summer, we have a lot of leaves, and this nightmare is uh, kind of covered. But uh, in the winter, when the leaves are gone, you know, uh, this uh, dynamic uh, lights, uh, we, I call it the chemical light. So this light uh, causes uh, a lot of discomfort in my, in my heart. And I cannot even drive along these places I like and don't walk there at all. And, well, I'm a born Moscovite, and uh, these places are really d dear to me. One more thing. I believe that the uh, lights uh, for celebrations are too aggressive. In Moscow, you know, we have the Christmas celebrations and lights throughout the year, and uh, we have many ways of uh, lights, like a new no-house. Say, we have uh, plastic trees, 
in spring they are covered with uh, plastic uh, flowers. So this looks like a sakura, but in the winter they are covered with lamps. And so the central square, the Revolution Square in Moscow. On one hand, we can see the Bolshoi Theatre. Uh, we have the small theatre, the child theatre uh, there. Then we have a great square with a fountain. So this is, you know, a really important historical site for many ages of Moscow. And there you can see the Karl Marx uh, monument. And there he is staying uh, within uh, this forest uh, of uh, bright and illuminated trees. So this is uh, out of place there. There haven't been any degrees on this. Uh, there haven't been any objections on this. Uh, no, no um, councils uh, have considered uh, projects like that. And I believe that the Association of Landscape Architects should start tackling this issue, since this is something which uh, causes discomfort. I, I think we can see from the audience reaction there that that's definitely a popular view and one perhaps that isn't always voiced. I mean, for myself, I, I love Christmas and I love Christmas lights and we have it for the month of December. But come January, I can't wait to get rid of them all and get back to normal. And I feel for you guys having Christmas lights all year long. So, yeah. Um, Peter, I'll just bring you in. Um, I wanted to ask you, because obviously we've got a lot of your views on lighting, and um, I think you probably have lots, of, lots more technical experience than, than a lot of people um, in that regard with your experience. Um, Jim mentioned solar lighting, and um, obviously everything has, uh, it, it requires some form of energy, um, and sometimes that energy comes from good sources, sometimes it comes from bad sources. If the lighting is directly linked to solar panels or is directly, you know, kind of um, powered by solar, um, then surely we know that that lighting hasn't got a really bad impact from an energy point of view. Is solar lighting capable of doing some of the things that we, that we currently do in, in lighting design, or is it not there techno te technically? Long time ago, I was asked if I would be interested to light a cathedral. And the client, that was a big city, European city, said, Peter, we want you to light it historically accurately. And I looked at them and I said, do you mean before the invention of electrical light or afterwards? <laughs> and technology is <laughs> very much a part of this problem. And what I think, coming back to Larissa's point, design is beginning to change because design professionals need to start delivering on evidence-based design. If they say that they're aiming to create well-being or if they aim to create increase in nighttime economy or whatever, they must be judged if they succeeded in doing it through evidence when it's finished, not what it looks like. And also the important thing for designers is that they are not doctors in white coats with that authority of providing solutions to problems. They need to create a shared platform, like some doctors now, when they don't see the person as a problem to solve, but they see him as a human being, and they respond to him as a doctor, as a human being. So that means that you need to share meaning. And coming back to the solar lights, Great. one of the big challenge is to see it in the whole sustainability cycle. Electric cars are a solution to emissions, but the lithium extraction and the lithium batteries and the recycling of batteries is incredibly unecological. So if you start concentrating on one, you miss the other. 
and Viscars is the same. They did an experiment in London where they wanted to see how children are affected by car pollution. So they gave them a rucksack which was sucking the air and filtering it. And they were thinking that they would record CO2 and all the exhaust gases. But to their absolute horror, they found that the filters after three weeks were full of microparticles of plastic, tires, and brake parts. And this is a pollution which is causing uh, less intelligence, health problems, and everything. And it's more dangerous than the CO2 pollution. Because, and the electric cars are heavier, therefore, they will use the tires more, the brakes will be used more, and they use more plastic. So they might actually be causing, if you factor in the lithium issues and everything else, and recycling, and the effect in microparticle pollution, they might be only marginally better than what we've got now. So you need I, to create I think a you're different right. way of thinking. I, th I think we do have to look problem. at all things. Everything has pros and cons. I mean, I think to say that CO2 isn't as... But to say that CO2 isn't uh, as, as bad isn't quite I, I right, did, because did, it's, did, 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 in terms I, of direct health impact, the other chemicals are bad, but obviously CO2, you know, has a bigger issue. It's the same with incinerators, because if the filters in the incinerator plant don't work, even for a couple of days, the microparticle pollution that's emitted from incinerators, if it enters people's lungs, you got it for life. Georgi, I don't think we've heard a lot from you. So just, um, I want to just kind of ask you, you did just say then, no lighting, so that you, we don't have an impact on the birds. But obviously that's quite difficult when it comes to areas close to urban, uh, to, to you know, wild areas close to urban sites, because people do want to access those sites. And to be able to access them, we have to give them facilities and services and lighting as one of them. So is there not any opportunity to work with landscape architects to come up with a lower impact solution for lighting in these areas that will have less of an impact on, on birds? <laughs> yeah, this can be easily done. I don't think we should engage with the architects. We know whom we need to engage with. Well, I didn't say that the project uh, cost us uh, 2.5 billion rubles. Well, lighting the Vorobi of Hills. These are not architects. These are the guys who have money and dropped into their pockets. And it's really impossible to come to terms with them. And to protect the birds, we can uh, you know, add lights uh, to the highways. And uh, so the lights will not go deep uh, into the forests. You know, the birds will go around uh, or above these uh, roads. And that's the way it used to be. This is not a problem, and it shouldn't even be solved, you know? So we've got five minutes left. Um, oh, sorry, Gleb, you have another comment? comment? Uh, do you have another comment? Yes. Uh, uh, if I may, I have a brief uh, uh, set of uh, slides for this. If you have five minutes, I can uh, show this. Okay, Natasha. Yeah. Okay, Natasha says yes. Slater. Чем листатист? Thank you. Just to illustrate the things we have mentioned. Yeah, we have said already. Yeah, this is the overall trend. A lot of lights and. Uh, where shall I click? Not only the Earth is full of lights now. We are now observable from the space. And we should be um, more careful now. And every city has its own uh, light and color image. This is my favorite St. Petersburg. So it's very reserved and respectful. And uh, some other things, some bright cities, 
uh, and Moscow. Sometimes Moscow looks uh, quite uh, well, respectfully, but here you can see the um, lights uh, mixture. Here you can see the car, the, the use of uh, natrium lights, uh, and uh, we also replaced uh, this by LED lights. And uh, so the red and orange color, which looks like if you can see the uh, light which is close to the candle, this is uh, morally close to us. So these are the things coming from the solar light, and uh, so this is close to 10,000 Kelvin, and uh, we consider it like to be a cold color, which is uh, better for, you know, say hospitals and technical buildings. And as we discussed it 20 years ago, we should be more careful and respectful. The light uh, shouldn't, uh, you know, go infinitely. This is a 20-year-old uh, illustration. You know, the birds had to wear glasses. Uh, yeah, so they had to find a way for the birds. And now, finally, they um, get an grip on this. But this is uh, again the na natrium uh, uh, light. Uh, and if you travel by plane and look at Moscow. So you can see that the bright spots uh, are uh, fewer now. Uh, we have uh, more lights uh, with the with the top bottom lights. Now we can see the LEDs. They have uh, replaced the mercury lights. So you know that mercury is poisonous. And now even inside a building, uh, you can see. Uh, People cannot uh, agree on uh, the same uh, light. You can see the yellow and the white light on different floors. And the use of bright uh, colors throughout the city, as it has been mentioned, in St. Petersburg, they have a law to limit this. In uh, Moscow, you see this uh, chemical, as we call them, aggressive uh, uh, and uh, strange uh, colors, out of place completely. Uh, so things are done in Moscow. We have some uh, um, lanterns um, turn downwards, but you can see that, uh, you know, the whole, the sky is uh, illuminated, so it's uh, all white, the city center, different uh, spec spectra, the holidays uh, lights, it is more delicate now, it's more refined, but the trees, Thaisa mentioned, the trees are everywhere and quite often out of place. And uh, some designer solutions, uh, which are, you know, used for a month, for instance. So these are uh, cups of light, uh, one uh, light spectrum, the mashes. Uh, this is uh, crazy in terms of uh, the light intensity. Well, but at least it's uh, homogeneous. And now we have a simple solution throughout Moscow. Now people decided to cover all the trees with this. Uh, this was a nightmare. But uh, now we have things like that, different uh, color combinations. And uh, so as uh, so you can see it's all uh, mixed uh, together. And uh, so this is uh, a motley collection. And um, the marshmallow, then chocolate, uh, then uh, uh, some um, canned uh, fruits, uh, so too much, too much of a good thing. That's too much to bear. And this is uh, further reinforced. Uh, this uh, motley collection is reinforced by the big uh, screens. So this is in front of my uh, block of flats. So this is uh, something which penetrates many kilometers. Well, I don't know. I don't have so many birds here anyway. So. But uh, you can read at home without any in-house lights and uh, different uh, quarrels. And uh, this has to be somehow reduced and uh, limited. Well, in the parks, uh, the spectrum are different. So Finland and uh, Russia are so more or less fine. 
So this is a beautiful park with different colors which are kind of balanced. So this looks like one uh, uh, style, some modern solutions. So this is uh, a brave uh, light solution, but within the concept. So some uh, holidays and uh, festivals. This is the, the Vedel Ha, and uh, the same trend is everywhere. Uh, this is Vologda, and uh, this is New Zealand. Yeah, sometimes it's uh, more respectful, sometimes it's uh, too aggressive. In some places where it works uh, all the time, uh, when this is uh, kind of um, um, an important site, that's fine. But when they destroy the ecosystem, when they destroy the natural, uh, as I mentioned, this place, uh, when the, the destruction of this uh, natural reserve, well, this it had to be protected. But now we don't even understand this. I even tried to understand uh, who is the owner of this uh, lamps, of these fittings. I tried to figure it out. It's uh, impossible. I couldn't make it out. Who is responsible for this? Well, this stuff. Well, if you don't stop it, you know, we'll have the different colors coloring the whole world. And we, this is something we need to stop. The Department of uh, Utilities is responsible for this. And uh, we have some chief uh, utilities man for this. I don't know his name. He said it's very good color. Everything is good and perfect. OK, to clarify this, in Moscow, we have a Department of uh, Fuel and Energy for this, responsible for this. And the uh, Unified Energy Corporation is responsible for this. So it's not the utilities. It's the other guys responsible for this. You know, opinions differ, so this is conflicting data. We've definitely seen there from the panel today is lots of different views. I think it's really important to always try to get balance. Gleb, you've definitely highlighted from some of your pictures some horror stories there, but there are sometimes there is, there is reason to have festival and to have light. But I think I'm going to finish with, a, I think, one of those beautiful quotes we heard today, which is from Guido, which is about this idea of protecting the night. And as our urban areas continue to grow and more people move to them, I think we need to have opportunities whereby there is light when it's needed and it can bring emotional benefit. But we also need to protect the night and have areas of dark as well so that we don't lose that contrast. So thank you, everybody. We'll leave it with that. One quick word. Uh, Peter Fink had a great uh, speech, and he used a very good technology when people are tracked uh, by a light. So I believe that uh, the dark darkness will come, and we'll use the lights only when we need it in the cities. And we'll have uh, the soft wave of light when we need it, and it will not interfere when we don't need it. Thank you. A very good idea. Yeah. Deal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, those who have been with us through the day. Thank you for coming. and. Thank you for showing resilience within these three days. I hope, well, I'm positive, that you'll be able to watch the videos of the speeches. It will be available from the YouTube channel when we upload this. I'd like to thank those who have watched us online. And I hope that the Flower Jam conference is um, going to help you move forward and become better. And see you next time.